public health. Um, Mark Fitton's visit to, to Iowa and uh, his presentation tonight has been uh, made possible through assistance from the Iowa Department of Transportation, uh, the Great Iowa Great Places Program, the Iowa Department of Public Health, uh, Iowa National Heritage Foundation, with a great deal of technical uh, and uh, kind of legwork uh, from Iowa State University uh, and a lot of different students here on campus. Mark's already uh, been here today um, and uh, done one presentation already, but um, unfortunately can't be here tonight. But we do have Borak, uh, who happens to be in town, uh, who's going to be presenting Hello. instead. Do you want to say a few words, Mark? Hello, very nice. Thank you for coming tonight. I come from Kazakhstan, visit you. Thank you. It doesn't do a bad uh, impersonation, but I think it's the best. Hey, yeah, he's very good. Hey, <laughs> yeah, yeah. oh. hey, man. <laughs> and, uh, well, I'm assuming all of you have read uh, Mark's impressive uh, credentials. Uh, not only is he an Olympic athlete, uh, not only is he a graduate uh, of the MIT, uh, but over the years, he, he has become recognized as the voice of the, the initiative and the effort uh, in America to you know, start a new trend to make our communities much more, one, livable um, and walkable. Uh, I know of no other individual in the United States who can speak more eloquently or with more enthusiasm on this particular topic than Mark Fenton, and we're all very fortunate tonight to really have Mark and not Borak uh, here to present. Thank you. Mark. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you guys for coming, even if it's under duress. I appreciate it nonetheless, and I, I, uh, I promise I won't break into my Borak voice until unless I see this gentleman here nodding off. Okay, <laughs> and that'll be the Borak routine. Um, I actually, my, what did you do? Did you break it? Oh, you know what? It went into sleeping. Um, actually, the first exercise we're going to do tonight is I'm going to ask you to do a little mental exercise. Uh, I've got a pedometer on my hip. Some of you have some, but not everybody got one. But you can. This is a way to win one tonight. I'm going to reset it to zero right now. I want you to confirm to me that it says zero. You see a zero? No, it says one. That's because when I moved it. I'm going to make it zero right before I put it on. Now, I'm going to wear it while I talk to you for about 55 minutes, okay? And at the end, we're going to look at the number again. And I want you to guess what it's going to read at the end. Now, the way you're going to guess is if you have a piece of paper in front of you, uh, write in just like a corner somewhere the guess as to what you think the number is, and circle it and show it to a neighbor. So I know you're not cheating, because I know you're like a type A personality, really competitive, and you'll try to count all my steps. So we'll have none of that during the game, all right? So write it down. Now, here's the deal. You have to make your end number end in a non-zero digit. So you can't guess one million. You either have to guess one million one or 999,999. 999. See, because I, I can break ties that way. Does so everybody understand? So everybody who's got a piece of paper and wants to play, write down a number right now, circle it, show it to a neighbor. Some number, any size, you may think I move a lot, you may think I'll move very little, doesn't matter. And the question will be, what's this gonna read? And it's a non-zero last digit. Everybody understand the rules? Okay, write it down, and then finish. What's your name? Darren. Darren is going to confirm that I am, in fact, setting it to zero. Got it? You guys have your numbers? Check. Show it to a neighbor. Everybody show it to a neighbor. All right. There you go. Check. Are you not guessing? Did you check hers? Okay. Okay, no more writing. You can write other stuff, but no more writing your guesses. Okay, so I'm going to put it on now. You have any luck here, Chief? Yeah. Okay. I had to restart it. Oh, that's nice. Um, so, uh, that's You might have to do the floor. Just see if it turns out. So proud of you. That's tell you about my mother, the epidemiologist. Who knows what an epidemiologist is? What does an epidemiologist study? Human diseases in populations, right? Well, she's not really an epidemiologist. 
But uh, she thinks she is. She, does, she thinks also that I'm still like her little kid that hasn't left home yet. Because she's always sending me emails. Even though I'm supposedly an expert, I've written books, did PBS TV series about health promotion and all that. She's always sending me stuff <coughs> over the internet that says, sweetheart, I've just read a great article. I now know what really causes chronic disease and what the answer is. So my mom is sending me these emails. And one she recently sent me said this. You know, in, um, in Japan, they eat a lot of rice and a lot of vegetables very little meat in the diet, and they have fewer heart attacks than Americans. Whereas, if you go to Italy, uh, they eat a lot of pasta and a lot of oil, olive oil, and they drink red wine, and they have fewer heart attacks than Americans. You go to France, they tend to cook with butter more often, and they eat lots of desserts, but they drink a lot of red wine and fewer heart attacks than Americans. Interestingly enough, go to Africa, they don't eat, drink much red wine at all. It's just not common in many of the cultures there, and yet they have fewer heart attacks than Americans. And she goes on to point out that if you go to Germany, they drink beer and eat bratwurst, and they have fewer heart attacks than Americans. Americans. So her conclusion, she said, eat what you want. Clearly, it's speaking English that kills you. <laughs> That's her epidemiological evidence. So there's your conclusion for the night. Stop speaking English. You're all set, and you're ready to go. Um, I'm actually going to suggest to you there's a, a more scientific approach that we could take to that. And, uh, and it might not be what you'd expect. It might be just as unexpected as the not speaking English issue. Most people think um, getting a healthier population is about convincing people to exercise, like go to the gym kind of exercise. I think the fundamental premise of what I'm going to talk to you about is that that doesn't appear to be the answer. And we have 20 years of evidence that said that's not the answer. And that we need to take on a much more creative approach to that. It's the premise of our talk, which is walkable communities. So here's the flow of my, my comments tonight. I'm going to ask the question, so what do you want? I'm going to talk a little about being a weirdo. Um, it's not specifically the Borat thing, but related. I'm going to talk about the four elements, the three Ps. I'm going to give you a brief editorial comment, and I'm going to tell you a concluding story about why I think it really matters. In the end, why I think it really matters. Um, when I talk about what you really want, what I'm really asking about, and I do this all over the country, I do workshops on this all the time. We did one of names this afternoon. Um, I'm asking the question, uh, um, what do you want for the future? Now you'll notice on the lower left here, that could be anywhere in America, right? We're building an awful lot of that. Big wide roads with more cars. Does anybody see the pedestrian in the picture? Tell me where the pedestrian is. Red pants. Yeah, red pants, right? The endangered species out here. Staying at the little Motel 6 over here, trying to get to Hardy's for supper. We watched the guy come out, hang out here for about half an hour, give up and turn around. So it's not worth it. I want those giant sized fries, but not that bad. In this, by the way, you'll notice in the picture up here, yeah, you had to drive over. That's exactly right. Um, in this picture, you'll notice I don't show you a picture without cars, but I show you automobiles and pedestrians coexisting. And um, that's kind of the evolving model. The question is, can we build places where all modes of travel can operate equally well? When we think about uh, the next generation, this really resonates with parents. When I ask this question, what about your kids? Is this really the sentence we want to give them? This is how they get everywhere? This is a drop off at school, but it could be the trip to the mall. Mom, I gotta get to the mall, I gotta get to wherever. And when I talk about our kids, in many cases, the students among you probably have lived this more than, uh, that is, you experience being carted around this way rather than being able to go to school this way. The older generation in the room like me, I'll ask this question, how many people over 35 walk to school on a regular basis? Hands up for the over 35 crowd. How many people under 35 walk to school on a regular basis? Okay, as a percentage of the people of relative proportions, it dropped dramatically. It says there are a lot more people under 35 than you here. Um, we could ask this question, where are our kids going to play? Will they play in these kinds of open spaces, or will it be, do you guys already know what that is? It's a McDonald's play place. It's that constraint where you've got to sort of get the fries to earn the calorie burn, apparently. I don't, I'm not sure. We could ask this of our economic development colleagues. What do we want the economic future to look like? An environment like this in which we can see the indicator species of a successful uh, economic environment, namely a shopper, right, or a couple of them here, or the upper right, the classic setback mall uh, or, or strip or, or, or you know, a retail environment. And I suggest to you that that's a really important question because in the short term, that big box retail might look like a good idea. But what we know from experience across the country is it has about a 10 to 15 year design, uh, design life. In other words, there's planned obsolescence. That was a Kmart, and once it went out, just down the street, I guarantee you, they built a Walmart, and then that giant big box became empty, and just down the street, they built a what? 
the Walmart super center. Exactly right. And that progression goes on all over the country. Um, and you see these empty, underutilized malls constantly all over the country. This is in Old Town, Knoxville, Tennessee, home of the University of Tennessee. And what's notable about it is it's the Old Town. It's that section of town that for a brief time was actually uh, utterly abandoned in the city. But now, where they have the nice street side cafes, the older storefronts, and so on, it's one of the most thriving economic sections of the community. And the question is, what do you think is the sustainable model? What do you think works better for the long term? Or we could ask this question. What do you want from the standpoint of safety? Do we find these kinds of roadways, the ones we want to cross, or these? This is a, a, a neighborhood street in Cambridge, Massachusetts, near a small school and a, a lot public library branch. Notable about it is the fact that this thing is called the speed table. That whole intersection is raised up. Have you guys ever seen one like that? It's not just a speed bump, but it's flat on top. You go up, over, and down. And it slows traffic down on that street dramatically. Perfect crossing for kids going to that school in the morning. So those are could on the surface be thought of as a bunch of rhetorical questions, you know, sort of, well, what do you want? But I don't think they are. I think decisions we make as communities every day determine what your answer is to this. Or decisions we don't make. If we just allow sort of the process to go on as it is, that decision gets made for us. And I guarantee you, in a lot of cases, what you get is that kind of road and the big box retail and the person stranded in the middle of the street. Do you guys agree? I mean, that's what we're building in America. Even in lovely Ames, as you think about the suburbs, that's what's growing rapidly right now. Okay, now a brief uh, comment on being a weirdo. Tim was very kind, and he mentioned in my introduction that I was a national caliber athlete and stuff. He was sweet enough not to mention what it is, but I think I owe a confession, so I'm going to tell you that I was a competitive race walker. You guys know what race walking is? Has anybody ever seen race walking? You guys heard of it at least? Yeah. Hands up. I mean, I'm serious. Are any not? Sort of odd looking, right? Yeah, I know you want to. Go ahead. Get it out of your system. <laughs> Go ahead. Chuckle. It's sort of goofy looking. This is a picture of me actually competing in the national championships a very long time ago, actually way back when they only had black and white photography. That's how long ago it was. <laughs> this is the 1902 national championships. And taking place, by the way, in Washington, D.C. Not kidding there. It's the 20-kilometer championship. I actually was a 50-kilometer race walker. So my admission is this. I bring, because of my background as, a, as a, an athlete, if you'll admit that that is athletics, um, a, a perspective to this whole thing. But a lot of people ask, but Mark, of all the sports and track and field you could have chosen, you know, why race walking? Sort of odd looking, outcast. But the, the answer is obvious when I show you the next slide. So I want you to look very closely. Why did I choose race walking? Well, of course, it was the huge crowds that showed up at our competition. <laughs> <laughs> that and the money to be made on the pro race walking circuit, of course. Now, true story here. This is the start of the 1984 Olympic trials in the 50-kilometer race walk. 50 kilometers <coughs> is 31 miles, so it's five miles longer than the marathon. Like the marathon, we started on the track. This is the LA Coliseum because, remember, 84 Olympics were in Los Angeles. We started on the track, went out through the tunnel, did a loop in the city like the marathon runners do, and then come back in and finish on the track. So this is the start, 6 in the morning. Uh, to give you some sense, 50 kilometers is going to take about four hours or so. To be competitive, you've got to be able to do four hours, meaning we walk a marathon in about three hours and 20 minutes and still have four, five more miles to go. So it's a lot faster than most people realize. But at six in the morning, not a lot of people in the stadium, except if you look closely for my mom and dad right there, <laughs> cheering me on, not kidding. Way to go, honey, what are you doing? <laughs> just, just 30 miles to go, sweetheart. <laughs> um, I want you to know the stadium was packed when we came in at the end, but that's because the mile and the shot put, you know, two of the real events were going on. But it was one of my bigger thrills in sports was to come back into the stadium there. So I come from a classic health and fitness background. I worked actually at the Olympic Training Center in their research lab. I then worked for Reebok in their human performance lab for a few years. Reebok is in sneakers. Um, my wife worked at Nike. I mean, so I'm well attuned to the kind of the classic sports and fitness approach to promoting active lifestyles. And in fact, as a result, um, one of the messages that goes out from a public health standpoint all over the country that's widely espoused by health professionals is that every American should get 30 minutes of activity a day. That's based on a pretty definitive study done in 1996 by the Surgeon General's Office in the United States. It looked at all that epidemiological research, except for the stuff my mom contributed. They didn't look at that. But all the other research, which fundamentally said if an adult accumulates about 30 minutes of activity a day, even if it's broken up, 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes stroll at lunch, 10 minutes in the afternoon, they accrue health benefits that cause a reduced risk for cardiovascular disease, diabetes, osteoporosis, obesity, clinical de uh, depression, 
dementia and old age, a growing list of cancers. We know that women who accumulate at least 30 minutes of activity a day reduce risk for breast cancer. We know if you are diagnosed with breast cancer, your rate of survival is higher if you get 30 minutes of activity a day. Pretty compelling picture. I mean, it's as close as there is to kind of the magic elixir of life. That's the good news. The bad news is if you look at the data on the percentage of American adults that actually get that 30 minutes of activity a day, through leisure time activity, in other words, going to the gym, going out for a run, or you know, lifting weights, conscious exercise, taking a class. It's about 25%. That's what the yellow line is here. Those who are sufficiently active, at least 30 minutes or more a day. Notable about the curve, if you look closely, is how unchanging it is for the last 20 years. Dead flat, right? Now, this is pretty distressing to somebody who has spent a lot of time writing books about physical activity and a TV show about it and magazine editor, videos. It's just, I, I get emblazoned with the big L for having made no impact at all. All of us, in fact, who worked in health promotion over the last couple of decades, pretty frustrated by this data. The only good news that the Centers for Disease Control can point to is this slight drop in the last decade or less of, in the number of people who are essentially inactive, those are sedentary populations. Totally sedentary. So some portion of the population is moving from doing nothing to moving something, but doing something, but not the, even getting to 30 minutes a day. So smaller doses or less frequent doses. <coughs> so it's really not great news. Why? Well, increasingly, given that we've been talking about it and done promotion and everything else in the last 20 years without moving that line, increasingly we're beginning to ask the question, could it be due to a toxic environment? An environment that is so badly designed for physical activity that it's just really hard to do anything. And I would suggest to you that a lot of America looks like this. And you'd say, okay, I get it, Mark, but you know, what are you going to do to that? Why would you waste your effort trying to make that more conducive to walking, for example? I mean, why? Would you waste your money building a sidewalk there? That's clearly a strip that's designed for cars. Drive-throughs, gas stations, right? Why would you build uh, uh, anything there for a pedestrian? Do you all agree that would be a big waste of money? That's not a rhetorical question. I'm looking for a response here. Oh. No? You don't? Why? Why should I waste my time? you got a walking path right there. Oh my gosh. Look at this. Young man says, if we look closely, do you guys see that? Gosh, I never noticed that before. But I guess if I <laughs> hung out, if I hung out on that road for just two or three minutes, I might have seen this woman walk out of the Walmart that's just out of the picture to the right. I might have seen her walk down to this bus stop down here. And if I accosted her, which I often do in public, as you can imagine, trying to come out of my shell a little bit. And if I went up to her and I said, what are you doing? She'd say, well, I'm walking down to the bus here. I work here at the Walmart. Oh, really? You know, um, the, how long does it take you? It's just about seven or eight minutes each way. And then at the other end of your trip, you know, when you get off near home, oh, about seven or eight minutes each way. So I do the math and I say eight times four is how many? Oh, wow, she exceeds the Surgeon General's recommendation. <laughs> 32 minutes. Isn't that interesting? But then if I say to her, how are you what, what about this environment? This is Rhode Island. Don't you get splashed in the winter and isn't it horrible? She goes, oh, yeah, I hate it. Well, then why are you doing this job? Well, it's actually my second job. I really need the money. How come? Because I'm trying to earn enough to pay for my car insurance so I don't have to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. Bam! <laughs> bam, bam, bam. I've just lost the battle. She's walking the 30 minutes per day because I've built such a toxic environment for it. She wants to stop, right? That's exactly what we don't want to happen. That's how we're losing the battle, I suggest to you. We have built environments that are so adverse to routine activity that we're going to have little success increasing physical activity in this country until we think about this issue in its broadest sense. And that's really what drives our conversation today. I come at it from a public health perspective, but I will suggest to you there are more perspectives here, and they are represented by this one issue of USA Today. The first that I've just been talking about is the headline, the small one below the fold, that says obesity threatens life expectancy. That's reporting on a, a, an article in the New England Journal of Medicine in March of 2005 that said we may well be raising the first generation in America to have statistically shorter life expectancies than their parents. Do you understand what I just said? So I've got an eight-year-old son and a daughter and a 10-year-old son. And they could be part of the first generation if the data continues to trend the way it is right now. In 100 years, the first time in a century this has happened, that a generation will have statistically shorter life expectancies than their parents. So they couldn't expect to live as long or longer. I mean, this is mind-blowing if you guys really think about what it means. We've entered the 21st century, and now we're going to start dialing it back. It's not HIV-AIDS. It's not Ebola. It's not avian flu. It is the chronic diseases of a sedentary lifestyle that are pushing it back. That's what the authors of the article say. Now, interestingly, 
let's say you haven't got a warm and fuzzy bone in your body, and you don't really care about kids. Or whatever, you say, fine, Mark, do that for your kids. If you're not smart enough to get your kids to exercise more, your own darn fault, too bad for them. Shorter life expectancy. Maybe you believe that. But maybe you're Machiavellian enough to be concerned about this. Same issue. The major report on the business pages on the fact that GM, General Motors, is reporting a total collapse in its profits for the coming quarter and probably for the next several. We've now seen that that's turned out to be the case, that the industry is collapsing on itself, laying off thousands, tens of thousands in some cases, closing plants nationwide. And every time they report on their plummeting profits, what do they tell us is the driving force? What is the single cost that is most beating them to a pulp? You got it. Say it again. Health care costs. You guys agree? Health insurance costs are killing them because we've got this increasingly safe, centered baby boomer population, me and my adult peers, who are all need cholesterol, like cholesterol drugs for the last 35 years of our lives, right? And diabetes medications, all of which is very costly. I'm going to suggest to you there's one more headline on here that's related, and that's this one. This is the one that said, at the time, the United States Senate said, yes, let's go ahead and drill for oil in the Alaska National Wildlife Refuge. Let's take the last pristine environment above the Arctic Circle and go after what, at best estimates, most generous estimates say, will be three years worth of oil. Three years worth of oil. Why? Because we've built a transportation system so dependent on the single occupancy vehicle, so dependent on oil, that that's where we have to go to get it. That we gotta, we're willing to destroy that environment for three years worth. These are all related. This is as much a part of the toxic environment as is this and this. Okay, take a breath. I know it's a little bit of a, a you know, sort of an out there perspective, but increasingly it's the one that public health folks are taking and those in environmental and uh, other broader disciplines are also looking at. So the question you might ask is, well, Mark, how do I make a less toxic environment, Mr. Smart Pants? If you've really studied this so closely, you should be able to give me a prescription. And that's what I really want to focus on for the next few minutes. What I'd like to do is paint a picture of the kinds of communities that are actually more walkable, more bikeable, more friendly to physical activity, and therefore I submit friendlier to the environment, friendlier to our foreign policy because we're less dependent on foreign oil. I mean, there are lots of reasons they're friendlier. They're healthier in the broadest sense of the word, but certainly healthy from a physical activity standpoint, right? So let me tell you a little about it. I think that the data tells us, if you read journals in planning, in transportation, in public health, increasingly. There are articles about this in all those disciplines now. And they say there are essentially four themes that tend to come through all the time when you say, where, what defines a place where we walk and bike more? And the four things that define by these questions, number one, is there a mix of distant, different kinds of destinations close together? Places for me to walk to. Number two, are there pathways and trails and facilities that connect those uh, destinations? Number three, are those destinations inviting? When I get there, does it invite me as a pedestrian or does it rebuff me? And last but not least, is it safe? In more technical language, you might say they are about land use, the network of facilities, site design, and safety. Those are the four things, I think, that come up again and again, the four themes. What I'd like to do is take a few minutes to actually share with you some of the remedies that are being used around the country and even take a couple of examples from the area from our workshop this afternoon in Ames um, that sort of, I think, illustrate the opportunities. Is that okay? So, from a land use standpoint, we're talking about things like making smaller lots rather than big ones. So rather than the big one acre lots you see in modern subdivisions, shrink them down a little bit and create shared open space. So instead of everybody having a giant yard that is pretty unusable and I have to do is mow it all the time, why don't we have less yard but take that collected space and turn it into a linear corridor, like a trail like this, the Capitol Crescent Trail in Washington on the lower left. Let's put our schools back in town where more kids can walk to them rather than giant consolidated school districts out on the periphery where every kid has to get driven or taken by bus. Right? While we're at it, let's look at old downtowns. Let's look at the traditional neighborhood downtown where we had retail on the first floor and housing above, apartments and things like that, and ask the question, could we emulate that? Because we tend to see people walk more when we have settings like that. So one of the tools we use is what's called mixed-use zoning, the idea of retail on the first floor but housing above. This is a grocery store, for gosh sakes. Normally a grocery store is a single-story building, but in Silver Spring, Maryland, they said, we could put, a, we could put apartments above that, and they're fully occupied. 
there's a whole movement called New Urbanism. We actually visited a neighborhood this evening called Somerset. It's, um, it's an area that's actually been in process for 15 years now. And, and it essentially takes the principle of what we built back at the turn of the century, and we're starting to build it now at the turn of this century with, again, retail, offices on the first floor, housing above. That's a New Urbanist development down in North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And here's another one from Rockville, Maryland. I'm only making the point I'm illustrating, and I would show you the slides from Somerset, but we just took them, and I didn't download them yet. We're doing this. There are developers out there willing to make places that traditionally, or that I should say contemporarily, recently, we've built as giant sprawling parking lots with buildings set aside, and we're actually mixing them up and making them look more like neighborhoods. Well, what about the second thing? What about the network? Well, the simplest thing we can do is make sure we build sidewalks everywhere, whether in residential areas or more urban environments. Another university town, uh, Lawrence, um, Kansas, uh, home of University of Kansas, and uh, not unlike Ames, you know, they've got a, a kind of a thriving downtown a business area. And it's a great model of what an urban sidewalk should look like with what we define as four zones, a building front zone, a travel zone, and you'll notice how clear it is here, a furnishing zone. You'll notice they've clustered things like trees and bike parking and the benches and newspaper boxes all in this zone, and then a curb zone, which is where you unload and load vehicles. It's a nice example of urban sidewalk design, but also things like bike trails and, and facilities like that that connect the network. All of those are necessary. Now, a, a brief technical slide here. Uh, this is a little bit technical, so I'm gonna ask you to bear with me, but you might find it on a test, so I think you should pay close attention. Um, I would suggest to you that those pedestrians aren't very comfortable, right? You notice how they're kind of hugging the grass. There's a sidewalk there, but it's so darn close to the roadway. Would you all agree that that's not one of your most comfortable places? All you need is a big double wide to come by with the, the mirror hanging out, and it could take your shoulder off unless you're hugging the edge. So increasingly engineers, designers, we're trying to move the sidewalks away from the road. But the question becomes, you know, the, 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 the longs will say, well, how far back would you like it, Mr. Fenton? And we actually have a recommended setback now for design manuals, and we're recommending this. So I want you to look closely, because I think it's a really clever solution. We think sidewalks should be set back exactly one Fenton. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a template that we can take out in the field to measure the sidewalk setback, and we're suggesting that all manuals, so if anybody knows anybody in the city of Ames, Department of Engineering or Transportation, I'm happy to bring the template over and we can check it out and have them put it in the manual. Okay, yeah, 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 and I know I'm not kidding you. Traffic engineers just eat that up. They think that's the funniest joke. And the president, oh, this is good. So I had a guy raise his hand and go, so uh, what is that in meters anyway? <laughs> that would be an engineering joke. Okay. <laughs> I thought that was just a killer. Well, another consideration is how much splash do you get when they that's right. Well, in fact, this becomes a snow storage zone. We, we actually talk about that. Right. We talk about that from an engineering standpoint, that you really do, in colder weather environments in particular, want to have snow storage capacity in that space. That's exactly right. Wow, you should come to one of the real nerdy meetings. You'd eat it up. You'd be talking about meters and everything before we know it. That's good. Um, I want to point out that for bicycling, um, uh, there's a hierarchy of facilities. For... Um, for um, uh, uh, low speed, low volume streets in the neighborhood, it's entirely appropriate to ride in, the, uh, ride in the street. By the way, that's my wife and my daughter on a little tag along. Have you seen those tag along bikes? You guys, anybody seen them? They're wonderful ways to teach kids how to ride and learn how to ride the road. Here, a, a bike lane, and here, a dedicated bike trail. And you'll notice this is not a very glamorous setting. We think of these trails in really glamorous spots. But one of my important messages is this. Sometimes, the least glamorous section is the most important. This is a one-mile connector of the American River Trail from this beautiful section that goes some 20 miles along the Sacramento River from Sacramento out to Folsom Way. Gorgeous. The downtown section, this last mile that connects you right to the core of the city, Sacramento State Capitol in California, not really pretty. They had to use some of the highway right away. It's actually kind of under the elevated highway. But it's made it a viable commuter route. You'll notice this guy has his laptop and his clothes in here. He's riding every day. He's not just going out for a nice recreational ride on Saturday morning. He's getting more than his 30 minutes per day by it being a uh, utilitarian trip. And the one-mile connector from the suburbs to the downtown area was the key thing that made that work. It's not always the glamorous 25-mile travel that does the job. Another not glamorous but really empowering tool, out in, Ames, we, out in the neighborhood where we were by Grand and 30th this afternoon, um, we found that in the subdivision, they actually had cut-throughs at the ends of the cul-de-sacs. One of the problems with cul-de-sac neighborhoods is for a kid to get from here to the school that's only as the crow flies maybe a half mile away, they've got to go out of the cul-de-sac and then to the major arterial road and then around and then into another cul-de-sac over here. And what's a half mile trip 
by direct line is three miles on the road network, right? But if you have these little cut-throughs through the cul-de-sacs like they have there, I was really impressed. It actually is shorter to walk than it is to drive from some parts of the neighborhood to others. It makes it more efficient to do what we want you to do anyway. Huzzah! Now we're moving in the direction of routine physical activity rather than I'm going out for my workout activity. I also want to point out that transit is an important extension to the, the active travel network because when you walk to or from the bus, you're getting physical activity. When, and you can, by the way, when you have bike racks mounted on buses, extend the bike distance. I'm a little surprised to see you guys don't have bike racks on the buses here, do you? I, I haven't seen any, so I'm not missing anything. Most university towns have gone ahead and adopted this policy. This is Mesa, Arizona, University of Arizona. I'm surprised you guys have, no, it's Arizona State, I'm sorry. Um, and I know that that's not a mistake we make with our major universities. I know that you don't mix up the state and the non-state university. So, um, <laughs> this bike rack, I think, is an appropriate tool for your bus system here. I think some of you should be activating for that. You should just be asking, why don't we have bike racks on the buses? It could dramatically extend the distance and the convenience of going distances. Please. Well, well I would suggest it's because Ames is actually quite small and compact, and that there are lots of people that have bikes, and I've lived in Detroit and Indianapolis, they have bikes, bike racks on the buses, but you put the bike on so you can go 10 miles on the bus. Yeah, that you know, doesn't acknowledge sort of what's have, happening to the sprawl around the city. You're talking about the core, which I think does have that compact feel still, but you guys are getting plenty of sprawl. You guys are starting to have more than enough kind of subdivision. Don't just think about the university um, community, for example, but just think about what's happening. Well, I don't own a car, so I bike. Yeah, well, but you're unique. You, you realize I got. You're not my target. You're there already. I got to go. You're way down in the 25 percent. We got to think about the other 75 who don't think the bike is even a travel option. Who think really it's something that you use recreationally on a Saturday morning. And for them, a 10 mile ride is a pretty serious ride. But they might ride a mile to a bus stop, take the bus seven or eight or six, right, or three even, and then ride the last mile to their office. And frankly, if that will transition them into being a routine rider, I'll take them. Particularly for the marginal cost of adding racks to buses. So I'm, I'm, I'm sensitive to your point, but I, I would suggest to you that this is, and interestingly enough, they just went through this debate in Des Moines, if I understand correctly, they just, and the, the transit authority there said, you know, it's not worth it. We're not going to get people to use these things. And they're, they're having initial pretty good success, right? And the transit authority itself is now saying, wow, we're surprised at how much ridership. Please. Well, I guess the problem would be that um, you have so many students here, and many of them have bikes. If you look around, there are lots and lots of bikes. Great problems to have. Bikes. But you know, you're limited to two. Yep, well, actually three. They make a free rack now, and many cities are upgrading. So this is Minneapolis, a lot of the university down in Burlington, Vermont, you know, in Madison, Wisconsin. <laughs> you know, they're going that way. They're going to three. But now you could say, wow, we've got trouble. We're not even ha ready to handle the three. Great, then let's come up with the next level of clever alternative. Internal house, one on the back, you know what I mean? I mean, sort of that, that please God, let that be the problem we have. <laughs> All right. I beg for the day when insufficient bike rack capacity on buses is the argument we're having <laughs> with our local transit authority. Please, Lord, let it come now. And I'm not being wise. I mean, but you know, you're right, because it is happening in the successful place of Boulder, Colorado. But we are so far as a nation from that. So I urge you guys, get these on for starters, then we'll have that next battle. I promise I'll come back when it's time to fight for three or for new buses. Because by then you should be going from diesel to natural gas power, you know, there's a lot of other stuff you should be doing too. By the way, one other thing, a neat story from that last picture, I do want to point out, Portland, Oregon, a bus stop in Portland, Oregon, I suggest you most bus shufflers or stops, which are often just a post with a sign on it, in the United States say, you're a big loser for having to take the bus, too bad you don't have a car. I really mean that. And this shelter, I think, says, how cool are you for using transit in Portland? Because there's a current schedule, there's a trash can that's clearly being empty, there's a full newspaper box, it is in fact a shelter, there's even some public art on top. Is it perfect? No. But it says a dramatically different thing about sort of what we say to transit users in our city. I think that's an important message. Let me talk about safety as a piece, crossing streets as a piece of sort of completing the network. And that's simply that there are lots of tools out there, from signs to these things called countdown timers. I've not had enough time to explore. Do you have any of these in, in the city? The things that tell you six, five, four, three. Anybody like them? Do you guys think they're beneficial or stupid? Okay. Well, research suggests they reduce 
the amount, the number of pedestrians who end up in the intersection at the end of the cycle. Because people are more knowledgeable, and you don't step off if it only says two, or, but you might, by the way, step off. There was some, one of the research studies suggested you will step off if it says six, if you know you're capable of running across in six. But if you get out of the intersection at time, I suggest it's still doing its job. You know what I mean? Because what we really don't want is people left in the intersection at the end of the cycle when the car gets green. So that they peg you when they just gun it without even looking to see whether you're there. Other cool tools are these things called median islands, and these curb extensions or bump outs that shorten the distance between the crossing. Notice with this island, so that's an island in the middle of the road. You walk out, and we like them by schools, by the way, because they allow a young child who doesn't have the same cognitive skills as an adult or you guys, you know, in other words, kids can't judge the speed and distance of an oncoming vehicle from two directions very well. They just can't process all of it. They don't have the, the capacity yet. So this allows them to focus only on the car coming from the left, get out to the island, and then focus on the car coming from the right. My question is, and this is a cleverness test, this will earn, earn somebody a pedometer if you know the answer. Why would you offset those two crossings rather than have it be straight across? Why would you, sir? Oh, give that man a pedometer. How did you know that? Are you a traffic, are you an engineer? I'd like to hear that, an urban planner. Good man, that's exactly right. Does everybody hear what he's, by design, we are encouraging the proper behavior. You know, we want you to make eye contact and see that oncoming vehicle. But by actually putting that chicane in there, we're actually they're diverting the individual cross. No, it was right here. This guy, they put that hand up. He, he earned that puppy. Good job, good job. Now, we can improve the crossings out in, in this section of Ames. I want to go look very closely. I sent my colleague across the street in front of me. I didn't go because there was no crosswalk pain, and I figured there was a good chance I was going to get hit, but he's expendable. And so, I didn't think that. Little did I know the real danger was the punji stick filled pit at the far side of the road that he ended up in. Um, swear to God, he's standing up. Now, you know how tall Tim is, so guess how deep that hole is over there. We were bummed because this is still within that half mile range of the school that we were doing our workshop from, and there's just no accommodation. There is a pedestrian head here, but no marked crosswalk, no curb cut, no sidewalk back into the neighborhood. In a lot of places in America, the network's incomplete. That's really the point of this. And we really, the pedestrian is an afterthought. And what we're increasingly trying to do is design what we call complete streets, streets that take into account not just cars, but bikes, pedestrians, and transit as well. A good complete street will be a street that gives you all of that. Third, I talked about the destination. And here's what the research tells us. If you really want to invite bicyclists and pedestrians, you're going to bring the building up to the corner, not set it back. You're going to have aesthetic elements, such as trees, benches, water. Water meaning fountains, a riverfront, you know, all these things, <laughs> lake, ponds, tend to induce people to get out and about under their own power. And um, bicycle parking, not least of all. Now, take note of that Walgreens in the top there. And that's in Portland, Oregon, and I will tell you that, and I know, I serve on a local planning board, I'm actually chairman of our planning commission in my town, south of Boston, and um, when Walgreens or any of the big chains come to you, they have a standard template, because Walgreens and CVS and Walmart, all the big national chains have kind of a standard design, and that would have the building, you guys probably all know this, where would the building normally be set, where would they like it to be? If they had their druthers, I'm going to put a Walgreens in your town, where do they want it? Okay. On a corner lot, and they want it set way back, do they want it up at the front edge? No. What do they want out in the front? Parking. parking. Why? So everybody knows it's there, right? They want them to see adequate parking. They say that. And they want at least two curb cuts, and their new standard has potentially four because they want the new drive through pharmacy. So they want the curb cuts for the parking plus two more openings to allow people to do the scooter on the back to do the drive through because God forbid you get out of the car and actually walk inside and pick up your, right, your cholesterol medication. Instead, <laughs> why not just drive through the drive through while you're eating your burger and fries and you got the next drive through over. Then I'll take my Lipitor too. Make that a super size as well while we're at it. Okay, so in Portland, they said, well, I'm afraid we don't do it that way. Our, we want you to bring the building up to the corner, and we want you to actually give us screening because you're going to put the parking in bed, and we want you to plant these trees and install the pedestrian scale lighting that's the standard for the neighborhood. And, by the way, put an awning over the building, some benches there because we've got a bus stop here and we're going to let people sit there. And, by the way, give us a pedestrian-oriented entrance at the corner, not just an entrance that faces the parking lot. And Walgreens will sometimes call your bluff and say, well, I'm afraid we don't do it that way. Corporate won't let us. We would give you a little berm of earth around the corner and do some landscaping. That's usually what they're willing to give you. That's their negotiable. And to the credit in Portland, they say, then no thank you very much. We deny your application. Ooh, but we'll lose the tax dollars. We need the revenue. 
And that's often what happens. City councils chicken out and cave on that, right? We can't cave because guess what? Important when we've gone so far as to actually make it the code, here's what the code requires. And guess what Walgreens does? Everything that they ask for. They can do it if you tell them that's what the rules are. That's what's going to get your fastest pathway to a permit. You're coming in for a permit. You'll get your permit fastest if you just give us that design. So guess what they do in Portland now? That design. Names could do the same thing. You guys could look at your zoning and, and, and subdivision rules and regulations and require this stuff. It's possible. It's certainly legal. And it works. We have increasing evidence to believe. So I challenge you to change the conversation and actually do it. Another element of site design, I just got to point this out, is the value of the places that we create. Remember I talked about water? Tennessee Valley Authority building in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. This is in Anderson, Indiana, small town in the middle of nowhere. 16th Street Mall in Denver, um, uh, Denver, Colorado. Uh, I don't even remember where this was. All I remember, oh no, I do remember. But my point only is, um, these by the way, uh, they're not walking in the steps. They have the grandmother and the grandson have stepped off of the steps and are walking down inside the fountain there. And I thought, well, what could be better? That's exactly how that should be working. It should be inducing people to be out and experiencing their physical self. Um, now, a little experiment we had in Ames today. This is a J.C. Penny that's across the street from a Walmart, which is next to a cup food, and that whole commercial strip right on Grand by 30th, roughly, in this neighborhood near the school. Is that familiar to any of you? You know what we're talking about? Okay, good. So I don't know if you've ever noticed, there's a little crosswalk there to get you from the Walmart over the J.C. Penny. And there's a lovely walkway that dumps you right out into the parking lot. Now, why is that a problem? Who's going to really do that? Well, who's going to do it, we saw it today, is this young lady who was coming from the cub, cub food and actually making her way the other, day, the other direction with her groceries, she's working her way through the parking lot to finally get to what appears to be some senior housing that's only about a block away. She's doing exactly what we want. She probably got a 10 minute walk in each direction, walking on the store for 20 to do her shopping. She got a 30 minutes of physical activity by simply not starting her car. Thank you very much. Did just what we wanted. And what we're gonna do to repay her is kill her in this parking lot eventually. <laughs> because she's a target. Right? What a horrible thought that what we're doing is making this woman try to prevail against these conditions. Hugging the little island there. Making her way through. Delightful, by the way. Said howdy to us. Didn't even treat us like psychotics as we walked into the picture. <laughs> Should have been on her cell phone. I've got some psychos following me. <laughs> Interestingly enough, you say, but there are some sidewalks out there. Why didn't she use the sidewalk that connected the store to her neighborhood? Because that was, the, uh, that was what was in the way. When she tried to go around this guy, she would have ended up with one wheel down in the dirt here and the party would have been over for her, her, for her, her um, cart. My point is, we do everything in our power to challenge this. And we could really, even once we've built it wrong, I think do a better job of retrofitting it, like this Marshalls up in Portland, Oregon, or this Safeway, Safeway in um, Rockville, um, Maryland, where they make the pedestrian way across the, the center. And again, require it by code. Require it during the permitting process, then you're not trying to go fix it later. In Des Moines downtown, I noticed a classic big parking garage. And I just want to say this. Generally, there's, it's always a struggle when you get down to university campuses or redeveloping downtown areas. We need more parking, the business owners say. We need those people that want to come, we want to come shop here or to teach here or to do whatever here. Give us a parking structure. If you're going to do it, and I'm not a big fan of parking structures. I'd much rather it be distributed on street parking and things like that. We can talk about that. But if you're going to build one, do what they did in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Just make it look like a regular building. And clad the first floor in retail so that to the pedestrian walking by, rather than feeling like you're going by a bunker here, you feel like you're going by just a regular street escape. Let's maintain that pedestrian environment and really create it. Last element was safety. And this is the good news. There is really a lot of evidence out there about how we can make places where we're less likely to kill bicyclists and pedestrians. There's good information on pedestrian oriented design. This is a speed table, a raised table here. This is just a classic ladder style marking, and it's a wonderful treatment for an, an urban intersection, but also for you know, suburban and rural. Um, many people, when we talk about making the roadway safer for pedestrians and bicyclists, talk about speed bumps, or what I'll call vertical traffic coming, making the car go up and down, vertical, right? So that's supposed to slow them down. Increasingly, that is falling into disfavor, particularly steep speed bumps, because young drivers like you guys have learned that if you take them at a fast enough speed, you barely know they're there, right? You just go, bloom, bloom, right over, and a speed bump doesn't do much. 
More and more, they're creating speed humps or tables, which are flatter on top, like the picture on the top there at a boys and girls club and school complex, where when a child walks across here, elevated now eight inches, they're that much taller over the hood of the car, and cars do tend to slow down by virtue of having to go up, over, and down. However, what we really like to use, first and foremost, are horizontal traffic calming tools, where we narrow the lane, deviate the car, tighten the turns, all of those things to slow you down without making you go up and over, without punishing the vehicle physically or the driver. Um, now, it begs the question, one of the roads we looked at today, again, this was Wheeler, just a block over from yeah. the school. I think Wheeler is the road. Now, we first observed the speed limit sign with a little red flag on it, which I think means Hey, we're not kidding. This is a real 25 mile an hour speed limit, <laughs> not the pretend ones you normally look at. I can't figure what else that is. I mean, what does the red flag mean? Like, no, we're a theory. Yeah! Come on! I mean, I feel like the poor residents here probably go on to the local traffic department and the cops a bunch of times. People are constantly whipping up and down the street. It's a natural cut through. I can see how it connected the neighborhoods. And we watched the guy blow down in about 40 miles an hour. You and I were standing there. Now, when we went out with our larger group on the walkout, we didn't see as much, but when you're standing around with 40 people in digital cameras and a TV crew from Channel 13, drivers behave differently. But when you're just out there, one or two people walking up, right, they were ripping down that road. So we looked at it, and I begged the question, what would be a good treatment? So some people want to say, ah, let's throw in some speed bumps, right? But again, I really don't think they're a particularly good solution. And they just tend to tick off drivers who will then rev their engines and so on. Some people say, well, give me a three-way stop sign, one here, here, and here. Make everybody stop at this intersection. That will be a stop that most people roll through, make cars rev their engines. And we have seen in some communities, you actually have to remove them because eventually the neighbors at that intersection said, people sit there and they rev their engines. We hear squealing tires all the time because they're so ticked that they're being made to stop when we know there's no cross traffic. Because a stop sign is a traffic control device. It's not a traffic calming device. So what do I suggest? Well, let's get really innovative. Let's put in a little mini island like this one in Madison, Wisconsin. And they say, come on, what do you mean here? These little islands, little mini rotaries, little mini circles, I'll call them, tend to, what they call them in Seattle is uh, DWI checkpoints. Because the drunk driver will wind up right up on this thing, blow out a tire, and the cops can pull up at a leisurely rate. So how are you doing tonight, sir? I wonder if I can see your license and registration. I'm going to have you do the uh, walk the straight line test while we're at it. Um, they are very effective because what they do is they bring speed down, but they don't unnecessarily stop a vehicle. You actually maintain better traffic flow. So everybody see how that would happen? I can come up to it. I've got to slow down to get around it, but I don't have to come to a stop if there's nobody else there, if I don't have to yield to another car that's in the circle. They're a good neighborhood calming device. And by the way, what you frequently find in many communities is you have an adopt an island program. The neighbors adopt it and do the care of the, of the, the vegetation and so on. So I'm just throwing it out as another example. One more. Again, just up there, and this is grand itself, in fact, down from those. And I was also pleased to see the bikes excluded sign. That just made my heart warm. But I understand why. It carries a reasonable volume of traffic, and in particular, pretty fast. This is just shot through the, uh, the window, so I apologize for the quality there. But, I mean, you can see why, frankly, they didn't have to put that sign there for me to think, I'm not sure that's a place I really want to ride. Um, and the question would be, well, what solution do you have, Smarty Pants? Is it going to cost a million dollars? This might be one of the cheapest ones out there. Um, traffic engineers will admit to you that four-lane alignments like this actually cause, among other things, one of the fairly common collisions is this one. The orange car is turning left, so the car behind it goes to jog around him at the last second because his blinker goes on, and they get in a collision out here. Or else they clip this guy as they're trying to make the, the zip around, right? Very common. So we're increasingly seeing traffic engineers look at, when appropriate, what we call a road dive. A diet is to actually take away some weight from the road, take away one whole lane specifically. So you go from a four lane alignment to three. One road in each direction, one lane in each direction, plus a turning lane in the middle. And what do you get room for? You get room from some nice bike lanes on the side. And interestingly, in some cases, these are shown to carry as much or even more volume than the road that had all four through lanes because you don't have that problem with the conflict with the left turning car. Does everybody see that? Now, this is kind of nerdy engineering detail, but I think it's really powerful to know cool to tools like this exist. Let's, by the way, while we're at it, add one of my median islands, one of those pedestrian islands, but I want to put in the little bend that you talked about. I don't have it in this image. And now we've dramatically changed the complexion of that road that formerly looked like a highway, but now looks to me much more like a complete street, a street that accommodates bicyclists, pedestrians, and the automobiles. So the question is, 
what is going on in the next room? <laughs> That's the question. You hear that? You guys hear me as much as I am? How do we get there? How do we do all the stuff I'm talking about? And let me just leave you with a couple final thoughts on that. The three P's that I promised. These are projects, changes in the actual infrastructure, programs actually encouraging this behavior, and policies. Changing the policies so that you end up with this all of the time. Are they doing an auction? <laughs> is, that really what it's doing? is it? It's a date auction. A date auction. Oh well, we don't want to miss that. I better wrap up. Can I get over there. Boy, he's looking for a date. I must go. <laughs> um, so the projects are the stuff I've talked about. One of the lessons I want to suggest: it does not always have to cost a million dollars. Things like restriping a road from four lanes to three can be cheap. Striping bike lanes, putting in bike racks, uh, convincing private institutions to provide bicycle parking, all I think are very powerful tools that don't cost much. But what do I mean when I mean programs? Well, I think one of the most successful is the ones some of you may be involved in. I don't know if you're in Dr. Welk's class, but the, the Safe Routes to School program that's being done at the Fellows School, uh, elementary school, they're doing what are called walking school buses. The idea of a designated route to the school in which adults, in this case university students, pick kids up along the way at designated times, just like a school bus, but we're on foot. And we walk to school. Why? Because we overcome sort of the fear that many parents have. Even if there is a sidewalk, they're afraid that the kid's going to be abducted, right? Or they're going to be hit trying to cross the street. Give them some adult supervision, and they can make it in one piece. So walking school buses are just one example. But back to Knoxville, Tennessee, University of Tennessee, they have a nearby commercial district. And I think you guys should try to get this started right here. It's a walk to shop program or a bike to shop program. You actually sign up for a car through Student Union, and, a, 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 and it's a collaboration with the, the, the business owner's uh, consortium. I can't remember, maybe the chamber or somebody like that actually facilitates it on the business side. And your card says, if you walk or bike, don't show up in the car. Or even take the bus, but just don't show up here in a car. Don't take one of the fairly few parking spaces we have in the, this commercial district. We're going to give you a discount. Two bucks off a pizza. And there were a whole bunch of things on here. So much off a pair of sneakers at the athletic store. And they went on down and listened. About 10 merchants did it. And they said they were having huge success. Kids were coming in and eventually getting every one of the little discounts punched by coming on foot rather than uh, 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 on a bike. Or I mean, not in a car. So those are just examples of promotional programs. There are lots of other. But it's the kind of stuff that classically public health people have done. Pedometer promotion. Things like accumulating stuff for dead using pedometers like ours. We recommend starting with a one-shot event but looking toward long-term effects. So, you know, if you're going to do a speed enforcement program, don't just do it for once for three weeks and then stop. Reappear on a regular basis if you're going to try to change the behavior. From a policy standpoint, I would alluded to a lot, I'll just recap. Things like zoning, subdivision rules and regulations. Even your DPW, your Department of Public Works standards on, for example, ready for this? Snow clearing. In Rapid City, South Dakota, they have a trail that they consider so important, it is one of their priority snow clearing locations, and it gets plowed just as early as their major arterial roads. Because this trail connects neighborhoods to a community center, to a YMCA, and to some downtown schools. So the theory is, let's make the plows hit this trail, this bike trail, just as early as they hit the major roadways. They especially have a special kind of, now that's uncanny from many parts of the country, but I think they've got their priorities right. And there are lots of policies. I won't belabor these other than to say some of them are easy. Getting things like your subdivision regulations to require every new housing subdivision that sidewalks. Well, a lot of people will go, okay, I could do that. You know, they won't fight you on that. Things like um, in allowing people to have um, apartments like, attached to their houses, what we call um, uh, um, accessory dwellings, like an in-law or over-the-garage apartments. Some of those things are easy, but some are hard. Things like creating, right now we set buildings back. Right? The bylaw actually says we need a 100-foot setback. In fact, we're now seeing communities build a set two line. You can't set the building more than 20 feet back from the roadway. It really changes the character of the road, makes it much friendlier for pedestrians. So what are the kinds of things you could actually do? You could decide to be a champion. Talk to others. You can say, I'm going to be the one that gets bike racks on the buses and eats. I swear to God, you can do that. You can decide to be the person. You could go collect some data. These guys that are doing the, the walk to school program are figuring out where the kids live, surveying the parents, what would it take, would you allow your child to walk if they were adult supervised? That's a form of data that's very informative. You could have an event like a walk to school day. You could go on and just fix the stuff that's not working. Could we paint the crosswalks? 
who can replace the lights and the pedestrian signals that aren't working right now? Or you can try something new. And it doesn't always have to be expensive. Maybe it's one of these programmatic things. Maybe it's just um, putting out some signs that indicate it's a bike lane or repainting the lane so you go from four lanes to three. It's not always a million dollar project. I want to close with a couple quick editorial points. Three, basically. What's essential to success? success? What may not be and why it really matters? And I'll probably say this in the meeting that we have on Friday with some of the community leaders. We're gonna meet with some of the regional mayors, right, county and city mayors and, and govern, government officials. And, and a lot of people think it's all about the money. Um, I think the most important thing from a success standpoint is the leadership, it's not the dollars. It's having champions who persevere. I have a picture of this guy because he's also from a Midwestern University town. He's Mayor Darwin Heinemann of Columbia, Missouri of the University of Missouri. This guy's 70 plus years old. He rides to most public meetings on a bicycle, and when he and his wife go together, they ride on that camera. I'm not making this up. The guy's not a whack job. He's a devoted bicyclist, and he simply practices what we preach. And, uh, and um, the guy has inspired an entire community to start to see this vision, which is a future for Columbia that isn't dependent entirely on the automobile, where people can get around on a bicycle and by foot and be perfectly safe doing it. And he's built partnerships, and this is what we see all over the country. It's not just public health people, but there are people in transportation, in public works, in urban planning, in development, in the private sector, the big landowners, the developers. They're all in the mix. And last but not least, those communities that are being successful take the long view. They don't expect to fix everything tomorrow. They know that we've been building it wrong for 50 years since World War II. It's going to take us more than one or two years to swing it back. So that's, that's kind of what you do need. Here's what you don't need. I'm not convinced money is the barrier. Because frankly, we are out there building millions and even billions of dollars worth of infrastructure every year. Right now, as we speak, you're building another suburb outside of Ames. And another mall is going to get built. It is. Right now, you're building another big mall. And the question will be, will it look like what I've described? Or will it look like another big box mall set behind acres of parking that's really hard to walk through, where another woman like the one I showed the slides up will have to walk through the parking lots to try to make it to her apartment? I suggest to you that right now, that's what it's going to look like. But if you start to change the rules and the policies and activate on this, you can change it. And what you do routinely, because those dollars are being spent by a private developer. The money's already there. The question is what it builds. So I think the trick is to improve either through the routine work that we do or opportunistically. We dig a road up anyway to do a work on the sewers, or it's time to repave anyway. That's when you put in the bike lanes. That's when you change the curb lines. Do it as a part of the routine work. I'm also not convinced we need a huge coalition, millions of people buying it. In fact, in many communities, this stuff is not popularly supported in the beginning. It's actually counterintuitive to some people. What do you mean a bike trail in my backyard along that rail corridor? Well, that's where those wild college kids are going to be hanging out, drinking beer, and then they're going to break into my house and steal my TV and run down the trail with my TV on their shoulder. I've had those exact conversations with people when we're trying to get a trail built along a rail line. You guys know about rails to trails, right? You've heard that term. We actually usually get that resistance at first. Those, by the way, are the same people who five years later when the trail is built, we see out there walking along the trail with their dog. Ah, yeah, we love it. Yeah, we were for this thing the whole time. We were real big supporters. Last but not least, why does it really matter? Well, we could do this list. We could overcome the inactivity epidemic. I could point out the fact that we kill at least 4,000 pedestrians every year, add a zero. We kill 40,000 in automobile collisions every year, add another zero. Nearly 400,000 die due to sedentary lifestyles. I could tell you that with what's happening with air quality in this country, we've got to simply drive less, let alone what we're doing with global warming. I could talk about our dependence on foreign oil and where it's driving our foreign policy. I could talk about safer streets, because when we have people out walking and biking, areas feel safer. I could talk about the fact that when we can walk and bike to the corner store, it means we're spending our dollars locally, rather than driving 20 miles to the giant mall, spending our money in a chain where it leaves town, right? I could tell you all of those things, and you would all say, okay, logical enough, I guess I buy that. But what I'm really going to tell you about is the real reason it matters. That's what I talked about at the beginning. That's my, uh, at the time, three-year-old daughter and five-year-old son were now eight and ten. I think they are who we have to do it for. I think, frankly, it is a mortal sin that we are possibly going to leave the built environment to our heirs with the way we built it. I think it's completely unfathomable that they would do it. And I think we owe them a lot more. I think we owe them much better. 
So I think we can do a better job for them. And I think much of what I've described tonight, well, on the surface, it, it, it might be a little bit challenging. The reality is most of you, I think, would agree. I could see how that would work better and how they deserve that. So I'd like to leave you with the thought that we should do it certainly for ourselves and certainly for you guys who have a lot more time left than you students here, a lot more time left on this planet than I do. Um, but I think really you should think about the next generation because those guys deserve better. I'm, I apologize for having done what we've done so far pretty badly. That's why I'm kind of devoted to this as my life's work now. And I'd like to ask some of you to consider how you can make just a tiny contribution. And your example, by the way, of simply not owning a car and riding a bike is a really good start. And I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I just mean that. Your personal behavior alone is a meaningful contribution to this. Because if you're out there, other people might look and say, I guess I can do that. So I'll ask you all one thing. Is there one time during the week when you start a car that you might be able, just once a week, you might be able to leave the car behind? So think about what your normal habits are now and say, could I once a week find a way to do something else? Could I walk to a friend in Hartpool? Could I walk to a bus stop? Do I start to, and you may say, hey, I live 20 miles from town. I got to get the class. It's a 20-mile ride. So I'd say, well, wait a minute. Maybe you do your ride in if you ever, you know, in your car. But when you get in town, do you ever start the car for a short trip? You're going to go to the automatic teller machine and get something you need, go to pick up a buddy. Maybe that's the one way to leave the car behind. So how many of you here, this is not a rhetorical question, I want a real hand on this, and I've only given you 30 seconds to think about, could imagine one car trip per week that you could lose? Serious question. That's pretty cool. For only having had a minute to think about it, if 80% of you do it, then it's a home run. You guys, thank you so very much. I'm happy to hang around, but we're closing in on 8 o'clock, and I know it's a school night, so thank you all. <laughs>